It's a friendly It's actually our glad to have David Goldberg from Brazil. He will uh, talk about a view of the land construction. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for having me back. I guess that means the last time I didn't do too badly. Um, so, I um, I wanted to, um, so last time I was here, I, I gave sort of a, a, a chronological look at some of the motivations for the Langlands program, and I thought this time I would find a way to give more or less the same talk in a, in a different way. So I thought we'd start with this opening note, which I just happened to know about, which is uh, this, this uh, sentence, which I don't know who to attribute this to, uh, it was, was on an NSF referee's report for young researcher, not me, but another mm -hmm. young researcher, uh, in the spring of 1993, said the language program, a long on promise, has failed to deliver results of any uh, major significance. And uh, I thought that was interesting. So in June 1993, a couple months later, Boss announces, first announces that he improved for Maslow's theorem. And we're all familiar with for Maslow's theorem, that the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, so though non-trivial integer solutions when n is three or larger. <coughs> and you know, that had been uh, obviously out there as one of the big problems to be solved. Uh, for over 350 years. Um, and so you know, it's a, it was um, deservedly a you know, really well celebrated uh, event. But for a lot of us, the, the bigger thing was that it actually came from the land. It, was, it had been known for a while that this could be done. Um, and so I should say, right around this time, also maybe a year earlier, I I had a conversation with a pretty famous algebraic geometer who said that he wanted me to explain the explain this Langland program to him. And I, I you know, it's, I was just starting out the game, so I had this kind of fairly naive, and well, I still have a fairly naive heuristic for what what is the Langland's program. And I was trying to explain that to him, and of course, it's very overarching, and it's, and uh, and finally he he was he just said, well, just tell me. Tell me what good is it? I said, well, if you could do a fairly simple case of this, you could, you could prove for Mod's last step. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, well, that's just a pipe dream. So, so, so in fact, the thing is that Wiles proved something stronger in, in the way to say is he established enough of what's known as the shimura Tanyama conjecture to actually establish the last theorem. So that, that statement, uh, the statement of his theorem is actually that every semi-stable elliptic curve is modular. So I'm going to try and do two things in the first part of this talk. So I'm going to try and take you through uh, what this statement means a little bit and, uh, why, and why it implies the last theorem. And then I'm going to go back and, and um, use some, do some uh, things that I probably actually did last time as well is to, to explain what some of these things mean and how that all fits into the line of this program. But it's also, I should say, very, very uh, an uncomfortable way for me to give this talk because I'm not an algebraic geometer, and so my knowledge of algebraic geometry is about what you're going to see on the screen. So, <laughs> so. So I should say, I uh, mentioned that the, the, the full version of this Fermor Tanyama conjecture was established shortly thereafter by the, 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 the foursome of Bruil, Conrad, uh, Diamond, and Taylor, and uh, yeah, sort of Taylor's gang, I guess, and that you can take out the word semi-state. So, and I'm not going to worry about what the word semi-state means uh, in terms of explaining this conjecture. So. It had been known for about seven years uh, at the time of Wiles' first announcement that, that if you could prove the Shimura-Tanigama conjecture, then you could uh, 
proved the last step. Okay, so let me just, I usually when I say an elliptic curve is, an elliptic curve is usually of the form y squared is equal to a cubic in x. Um, it turns out that uh, any truly elliptic curve, and there's some conditions, so any, any elliptic curve actually can be written in, in this form uh, by change of variables. This is known as the Weierstrass form. That's not going to be so important to us. But associated with this is something called the, uh, the Hasse Bayes eta function. And so there's such a thing for any curve, for any variety, in fact, there's something data function, and it's essentially given by evaluating the number of rational points over a finite field. Right? It's actually the number of points that are not rational. Per unit, right? And then you take this product, and it's, uh, it's sort of a mysterious product when you see it, but it, uh, it, my understanding, again, my naive understanding of algebraic geometry is that this came up in some, in some uh, analysis of invariance on on certain varieties, especially on curves. Uh, these kinds of things started to come up. And, and this is an example of um, you know, what's known as generally as a zeta function or an L function. And the story that I sort of told last time I was here is that uh, it was a recurring theme in several branches of mathematics that functions sort of like this, infinite products um, in polynomials of P to the minus S, um, as the local factors, as the, you know, as, the, as, the, as the factors were appearing in all kinds of places, and, there was, and this program is an effort to connect them. And this is a, this is a, where the line of this program comes from. So, so what was known about this, so there, are, there were a lot of conjectures about uh, the behavior of these kind of L functions. Uh, so, for instance, there's still some a lot of conjectures about these, like the Bergson Dyer conjecture. Uh, and uh, essentially, if you can prove things about the, you know these L functions in terms of where they converge and whether they continue analytically and what the what the nature of their poles are, then you can prove various things about about things like elliptic curves or uh, some theorems of number theory. So. So what was known was that it did converge in a half plane, I believe it was for s greater than real part of s greater than three halves. And the idea is should it, that it should be continued to the whole plane meromorphically and satisfy this functional equation. And again, this looks very much like Riemann's zeta function. If you replace one by two. The positions of zeros are also interesting for yeah, this function? No, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Zero yes, in fact, yeah, zeros are very interesting. Uh, for, for a certain reason, yeah. Um, but that's again, and uh, that that the zeros are actually the, the thing that I know probably the least about. So, so I'm going to explain what this means a little later. But for right now, I'm going to use the language of. Uh, so I'm going to just use some words without explaining. Them. So I'm going to say that I have a weight two modular curve for the group gamma zero of n. I won't tell you what it is. It's the subgroup of the modular group SL2Z, for which uh, essentially is congruent to, you know, things look like one zero and you mod out by two. So that's essentially what the group that we're looking at. It's a unimodular group model. And such a function, whatever it is, some kind of nice function on the upper half plane, which has some nice properties, which I'll, I'll get to in a little while, does have a, has a Fourier expansion. And so from this Fourier expansion, one of the ways that they sought to analyze these kinds of functions, which were interesting for various reasons that we'll again see a little later, was to form associated L functions or zeta functions that look very much like the one we just saw for an elliptic curve. That is, it's I mean, if you didn't know that the left-hand side was a curve or a modular form, you couldn't tell. So, the yeah, so that's the, the these things look very similar. And where this, by the way, where this one comes from is this one comes from the two, by the way, here in this case, and uh, as we'll be explaining a little later. And so, in 
I think around 1957, I couldn't quite date it, but Eichler and Shimura uh, showed that if I had some thing like this, a, a function of this form with nice Fourier expansion, then in fact I could associate an elliptic curve to that form in the sense that there is an elliptic curve, I'll call it e sub s, so that the L function for f is the same as the L function for the group. And so since you want to analyze these elliptic curves in terms of their zeta function or their L function, then in fact, if you could prove something by say, say you could prove analytic continuation for modular forms, then you prove analytic continuation of the L function for, or the zeta function for a lot of elliptic curves. And the conjecture was that every elliptic curve is modular, is, mean, means that everyone comes from some, this is, this is a bijection. And so, so, um, so that's the conjecture, and, and, and I, I should say, I, sh I should mention, I guess, that sometimes it's referred to as the shimura kamiyama Bay conjecture, the kamiyama Bay conjecture, and there's some, all kinds of arguments about whose name goes on it and where, and I don't really care that much, okay? And, and it's no disrespect today that, uh, that I didn't put his name there, it's just that I, I, I learned it as this, and and that's, that's, the, that's the way I remember it. And, um, and nothing but respect. So if any of you are great followers of Bain or upset that I didn't put his name up there, it was not, it was not meant as well. But this is an example of, of what, what's known as Langland's functoriality. And it's a big word, but in this, a big phrase, but in this sense, means that in some sense, I mean, so if you, you go back, and this form is, so there's some things here. There's a weight two, so that would imply that you could have lots of other weights, and it's for this particular subgroup. So you could have lots of other kinds of subgroups of even of SL2Z, let alone of other groups. So in fact, this is a fairly small collection of automorphic forms that tell you all about elliptic curves. So that, you know, the whole you know, the theory of elliptic curves in terms, at least in terms of analysis of their zeta function, could be completely understood if you understood the, the theory of automorphic forms. And that was definitely one of the prime examples of um, something which I'm sure motivated Langmans to form, formulate his philosophy of um, you know, what's now known as Langmans conjecture. So, so how does this get the last step? So that's so I should mention that, and you'll see that, in fact, to me, this is, I mean, again, not that it wasn't a huge result, but it's, uh, I'm going to not say too much about it, because that is sort of just a byproduct of this, to me, bigger result on, on what it occurs. So Gerhard Frey, apparently in the early 1980s, uh, started looking at this curve, which is an elliptic curve. It's not quite in the form that I gave earlier, but it is an is an elliptic curve, and it can be put in the Weierstrass form, but that's that's not its Weierstrass form, but that's fine. Um, but um, so, and and apparently some people had looked at this uh, about 20 years earlier as well, and so there were some some results around about it, about it, but he apparently uh, had some reason, some intuition, or some reason to believe that if you had a solution to the Fermat equation, then the, this curve, E, would, in fact, be not modular. And he couldn't prove this, but he, he, did, re he did reduce it to a conjecture, which is known as the epsilon conjecture, which I think is the technical part of that I don't think we need to get into, but, and that I couldn't actually explain it very well anyway, but um, but he, he did develop this conjecture that said that this, this curve, this sound known as a Fry curve, would not be modular. And in, in 1986, Ken Rivet was able to finish this, and that shows that if you know Shimura Kamiyama, namely that every elliptic curve is modular, then you can't have a solution. So, so, 
So for many of us, in, you know, in, in this game, the Vermont, you know, Vermont's last serum is just one step along what will be, you know, a long, long road to to establishing the Langlands conjectures. Um, how long is the road? Well, the road is long enough that we don't even know what the conjectures are in some cases. Still, they're not still, still in some cases not even well formulated. So, yet you know, we're 40 something years into the program. So, and um, and so that's what I said here is that we're still refining these conjectures. Um, as I'll mention some of those things a little later. And so, I think you know this. This at least is uh, well. I think it's clearly motivation to say, okay, now, now, what is this language conjecture? And what is the language program about? Um, so, in fact, not the same algebraic geometer, but one of his postdocs came to me <coughs> after a while and announced his proof and said, are you going to give a seminar on on uh, modular forms and, uh, and elliptic curves, and I said, well, it's no easier than it was last year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I said, you know, I said I'd be willing to, to try, but I, mean, I don't think I'd be very good at it. And um, and, and uh, but you know, so but clearly, you know, a lot of people got very much more interested in the in the language program. So. <coughs> So let me go back to the idea of what's, a, what's an automorphic form. And so, <coughs> um, so you have the upper half plane in the, in the complex numbers. And well understood, one of the things you learn in complex analysis is how the group of, I mean, the unimodular group, if you will, the SL2R, acts on the, very nicely on the upper half plane by fractional linear transformations. And this is the under, underlies a lot of interesting complex analysis, like formal mapping and things like that. And so automorphic forms are, are functions which are not quite a variant with, with respect to this uh, action uh, for a subgroup, but close to, quasi, quasi invariant, if you will. So an automorphic form of weight k for, so I had some discrete subgroups I showed you one before, so of course SL2z is itself discrete, or if I just take the ones, the large, the larger, the smaller group here that where <coughs> both off diagonal entries are congruent to zero mod n. Um, that's called gamma of n, you see gamma naught of n over there. So just for some discrete subgroup, if I have a homomorphic function on that H, so that it's not invariant, but when I act by an element of this discrete group, I get this, well, it's called the automorphic factor. So it's the, it's the denominator here, it's CZ plus D to the K. Okay, so, um, and you know, of course, when you start to read about it and learn about these things, it's, you know, it seems rather, Rather odd, um, a rather odd thing to be concerned. You know, why would you want to be concerned with these? But it turns out, <laughs> I, I thought I might have said something. Uh, <laughs> I'm about to, I'm sure. So, but it turns out that there, it turns out, as usual, at least, you know, I mean, we sort of learn sometimes mathematics backwards if somebody gets uh, you know, one of our uh, speakers to the graduate. Students uh, recently pointed out is, you know, is that you know, somebody knows the answer and then they tell you, and then you have to work backwards to see why you were interested in the question in the first place. Right? So, you know, why would you be interested in these things? Well, so here's a, uh, an interesting example uh, that uh, Jacoby had studied called the data function, and it's very simply it's the sum from minus infinity to infinity of. E, uh, I make a mistake, does this, of course. It's n equal to the infinity of E to E to the pi i n squared z. So it turns out this is a, a weight one half form for gamma of two. So that's the things which are congruent to you know, uh, one mod two. So that is, it means that uh, A, B, C, D. 
And in this case, A and B are odd and B and C are odd. And, and the determinants of one. And if you'll notice that theta uh, minus one over Z is I Z to the one half theta Z. So this means we can actually expand gamma by adding this reflection. And that's very important. And now a very naive thing to do is, well, write out its write out its Fourier series this way. And it's just for n equals zero to infinity, just whatever the coefficient of e to the pi n z is, then a n <coughs> turns out to be the number of ways to write n as a square. And so n is either if it's if n is one, it's a I mean, then is zero, excuse me, it's the sum of one square, right? It's, it's can be written as one square. If n cannot be written as, as a square, then a n is zero. And if n is non-zero and can be written as a square, then it can be written as a square in two different ways. So, well, that's rather nice. That's rather silly thing to do. But it gets more interesting if we look at the quadratic form of degree r, where you just take the sum of the squares. And I take this function theta r of z, so you sum over all the integer <coughs> r tuples, e to the pi i, then you evaluate the, the uh, quadratic form. Now this turns out to be, you see, this turns out to be the same as the, the, the function I just saw to the, the r powers. You take that, that previous series and you take its r power, it's actually this. So, <coughs> Then you use the fact that what you know about theta to see that this is in fact the weight r over 2 form also for, for gamma, same, for the same group. And now if I write out its Fourier expansion this way, now it has a very interesting interpretation. Right? So for a given n, the coefficient here is the number of ways to write n is the sum of r squares. And these are so-called varying problems that you know, people are actually quite interested in. So. So, um, so that's that's one example. Another example is uh, Ramanujan has this function that came out of studying, um, I think, the partition function, the part which I think I mentioned later here on the slide. No, I didn't mention it here on the slide. Oh yeah, on the slide. So, um, so it's related to partition. I should say the other partition function, sometimes called tau of n. How many ways you know, can be partitioned? Uh, and Something having to do with this, this function sort of came out, that turned out to be a weight 12 form. And uh, the Fourier coefficients are related to this um, partition function. And also, quite often, uh, in number theory, we have Eisenstein series. And these are functions that, here's an Eisenstein series, and sum over pairs of integers, of course, not zero. 1 over CZ plus D to the TK. And you can see why something like this would have the transformation property, right? because right, essentially the denominator is right, it's right there. It's not hard to see that that's also our morphic form. And this is actually what's called a modular form. This is, these two are actually modular forms, which means they're actually forms of the full form. And Fourier expansion here involves what's known as the Cape for Newman. And again, if, but that this is just my quick way of saying that it's um, started to become known at the you know, late 18th, 19th and early 20th century that coefficients of automorphic forms could really um, be interesting, have interesting arithmetic information. So the example that I know of is that there was a way to relate Fourier coefficients of that fourth data function to a certain Eisenstein series. And by doing this, Jac Jacoby could show that, in fact, there's, a, there's actually a formula for the number of ways to write, write um, a number n is the sum of four squares. And so I've always found that rather remarkable that we've done that. Way. So, um, but then, so then, um, Hecke um, wanted to approach these forms by associating to each form a, a certain Dirichlet series. So a Dirichlet series <coughs> is just a 
is just a, a series of the, of the forms, some coefficients over n to the x. So, for instance, when when all the a n's are one, this is the this is the Riemann zeta function. So it was a, I think it, he was trying to generalize. Um, you know, as I say up here, trying to generalize Riemann's use of the theta function to analyze the the the, the Riemann zeta function. So that I, I maybe should say a little bit more about that without saying too much about it. That 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 is one of, certainly one of the ways where the theta function came to be studied quite uh, you know, t intently was that in being able to analyze the Riemann zeta function, look for its poles, uh, Riemann had um, employed this, uh, the Mellon transform, and the Mellon transform, you know, the, the Mellon transform involves this, this, this data function. So, um, so suppose I have this Dirichlet series, and I um, take say uh, so I have this fixed period. So I want my I want my automorphic form to be periodic, and I want it to transform in some nice way. So I just take my coefficients and whatever they are here, I just take some sequence, and I want to form this function. I want to know is this an automorphic form, and so I could. Also look at the associated Dirichlet series, right? Take the same coefficients and form this Dirichlet series, and then there's some normalization that goes on here. But I don't really want us to be too concerned about it. this is the classical gamma function if you care. But the theorem of Heck is that the following two things are equivalent. Is that if I so if we go back, so my my phi is essentially just a normalization of this of this this Dirichlet series. So the Dirichlet series is uh, meromorphic and has some fairly simple, two simple poles. So we could say it this way, that, that the, this normalized Dirichlet series plus these two factors is entire, is bounded in vertical scripts and has satisfied the functional equation. So, and, and the C here is the is the coefficient you know, that comes out of that functional equation. Though. And the other being that um, the function that I formed, that infinite, that, um, to go back this, this function I formed on the upper half plane, which I knew was periodic with period, uh, period H, that it also satisfies this automorphic condition for for minus one over z, and so another way to say is that this is a, a weight k form for the discrete group generated by translation by h, and you know essentially minus one over z. Z goes to minus one over z. So it says that the that if I look at those sequence of coefficients, they're associated with a nice Dirichlet series, if and only if they're associated with non form. Nice means you know has has these properties. Bounded in, bounded in vertical strips entire satisfies the functional equation. <coughs> Again, you know, for the Riemann zeta function, you know, this is essentially this is essentially what um, what's known. So, so what about the Euler product? The fact that you know, for the Riemann zeta function, we can you know, write this as nice infinite product. So, if you're lucky. And your coefficients are multiplicative, at least to the extent that whenever m and n are relatively prime, then a of n times n is a m times a n. Then just formally, you can you can take your <coughs> you can take your uh, Dirichlet series and factor it this way because of this property, and then that would be uh, an infinite product. And of course, if you know your Dirichlet series. Converges, then of course it's infinite product has to converge. And so you might want to say, well, wait, when would that happen? And it turned out that that could be answered in terms of um, some hard analysis, some functional analysis. That is, um, 
So, so I should say that right, I should say that now I'm going to assume that a a not that the the zero coefficient is zero. So these things are called cuts forms, and I don't really want to go into why why those are the the interesting ones. It's not that the the other ones aren't interesting, but but there's a so Hecke studied studied a, a collection of operators, in which are known as Hecke operators, and what he showed is that if you have a, a cusp form for SL2Z, and if you normalize it so the leading coefficient is one, then the Fourier coefficients are multiplicative, so you have a have an other product for the Dirichlet series, if and only if that function is an eigenfunction for this for this collection of operators. And uh, it turned out that the coefficient, uh, the eigenvalues are in fact the uh, the coefficients that A sub B. And therefore the therefore the factor that comes up here is exactly one minus A P P to minus S B the K minus one minus two S. And also when K is two, then this is exactly the case we looked at. It showed up in the and this is more autonomy. So, so this generalizes the uh, analysis that you learn you know, when you take you know, complex analysis and you look at the the, the Riemann zeta function. Um, this completely generalizes that, and it generalizes something even a little more, which are what are known as Dirichlet series, which I'm <coughs> not going to say as much about as I should. Is a very important, um, but um, I'm sorry, Dirichlet characters. But if you have a, a character, um, so that's a multiplicative function on z mod n, essentially z mod capital N z, and then you extend it by zero. Um, and of course, when I say z mod n, well, I z capital N z units cross and then it's if if anything is anything that's not a unit mod n you just you set you set the value of chi n to be zero. And these are these were very important in Dirichlet's study of finding primes in an arithmetic pro progression. And this kind of function showed up. And of course now what I just showed you for automorphic forms those those in fact so generalize the, the you know, these degree one, if you will, L functions. So, so now, um, so as I said, these are interested in, and they're interesting in, in uh, something called class field theory, which asks what are all the abelian extensions of a, a given field, a given number. So we have some examples, some from geometry, that's elliptic curve, number theory, so these Dirichlet characters above, which I didn't say much about. Harmonic analysis, so automorphic forms, we're producing functional analysis. With analytic behavior of these L functions plays a central role. And so it was, I think this should be against, uh, this backdrop that said that the Shimura Tamiyama conjecture, I think, was formed. Um, you know, in addition to the fact that I mean, it's very, very, I mean, again, very, very interesting that, you know, the construction of an elliptic curve from a form was uh, a rather remarkable, I think it was probably you know, a rather remarkable thing. And, um, and it fits into even a larger context, let's say, which motivates, uh, motivated language, uh, certainly motivated language. Um, you might notice a lot of times I, I mean, I've used the phrase language conjecture, but I like language philosophy. I like to say language philosophy for a couple of reasons. One, I've already said that sometimes some of the conjectures are still not well formed, but even more, just out of deference to, to language, he never likes the word conjecture. Uh, so he call, he always talked about, uh, if you read his papers or talk to him, he talks about problems. He formulated, he said, I have some problems in the theory of automorphism to figure out how things go about. Now I have to, it's hard to go any further without mentioning Tate's thesis. So Tate, um, in his 
Princeton thesis in 1950, actually went about reproving this result of Hecke about the, the, the Dirichlet series being nice if and only if something is an automorphic form. Um, so he went about uh, reproving this in a, in a very novel way. And so for this, let's take a finite extension of, uh, of Q. So that's what's known as a number field. So I'm going to fix a place or a prime. And so that just means it's a, you have one of the completions of E. So completions come in two kinds. So there's, they're finite or non-Archimedean completions and infinite or Archimedean. So a finite completion, it's totally disconnected. So it's, it's the quotient field of a dedicated domain. So it has, that's a, a ring O V, which has a unique prime or maximal ideal. You just call it P V, and it's principal. And so we use I to be for generator, and, and in fact, so the quotient is a finite field. This quotient has to be a finite field because it's a maximal ideal. And so Q sub V has to be, in fact, the prime power. And infinite just means the completion is either isomorphic to R or C. So, you know, a simple example, of course, is we have Q. So if P is a prime, then you have the p adic numbers, QP, p adic rationals. And of course, when P equals infinity, you have the real completion. Those are all the completions of, of the rational. And this, remember that this, I remind you, this QP is just, um, you can think of that as completing the rationals with instead of respect to the Archimedean absolute value with the absolute value which is determined by how highly divisible is a is a rational by the prime power p. So, right, the higher the power of prime p, you can factor out of the rational number than the closer to zero it is. Right? So Tate's idea was to put all these primes together on equal footing. So essentially, you could think that Hecke really just used this one, right? You just use the real numbers and some hard really hard, as far as I understand, functional analysis. And so Tate's idea was to simplify this by looking at each prime, and then somehow putting together the information that you got from each prime. And so for that purpose, he formed something called an Adele ring. And this was, this was really clever, which was you just take the product of all, all these completions. Now you can't really take the product, because that's not well defined, so you have to Modified, and essentially that just means that um, the absolute, you take the, take the infinite sequences where almost everything has an absolute value. Right. And so when you have something like that, you can take a character, and you could show, you understood that these things actually were somehow the same as these Dirichlet characters that we were looking at. And from this, he found that. The, there were certain Euler factors, in quotes, that, that were showing up just in terms of local harmonic analysis in the, in the Fourier transform. And so, without going into too much, that is, you form the global L function, you take the, the product of these things, where the, these local or the fact that they're given by, well, this turns out to be the thing which turn, exactly turns up in the harmonic analysis of uh, applied to that local character chi d. Then this L series, it has uh, analytic continuation of functional equation. And also, you can, I can tell you what this constant is here. Namely, it's given by some product of, of local constants. So that is, there's a local functional equation, which I didn't mention, and this comes out. And this side just is a choice of, choice of additive character at each point. And it's sort of interesting that you have to make a choice at each point, at each prime, but the product is independent of that choice. So Tate's proof is elementary. It's really, I would say it's elementary, it's really elementary. And so, you know, when students want to study um, in this area, it's oftentimes the first thing you give them to read. Um, a student who's you know, taken uh, graduate algebra, graduate real analysis, and maybe complex analysis, I guess. Um, it's pretty much right. I mean, there's, there's a few words from number theory you need to know to read this. 
But outside of that, it's just really first year of graduate analysis, first year of graduate analysis. And it also gives a global interpretation, of, of this local global interpretation of a function, which, again, was a, that was really not. So, so it's always an interest to me that I mean, this, this thesis was, um, I mean, it had a, new, had a new result, mainly this. Right? I mean, it had lots of new results, because the local results were on new. But it had, had, a, had a new result, a uh, big new result, which was this local global interpretation of the, of the functional equation. But the part about the L function having a functional equation is actually it's heckensystem. So it's actually a, a new proof of heckensystem. But it's such so startling that it is really one of, it was one of the most important theses probably of the 20th century to reprove an old theorem. So that's how. So Langlands looked for a way to unify all these ideas, and, and I'm sure I'm leaving out lots of ideas. So, so how can you extend this idea of the local global principle more automorphic forms? That was, I think what he was thinking of. So a lot of questions. So what should the right definition, right class of automorphic objects be? So in fact, it wasn't even known at the beginning what, what you should mean by an automorphic form beyond the ones that were defined classically. So we now have an idea of what an automorphic form is for a much wider collection of objects. Um, what are the L functions? What, when are L functions of interest? Okay, write down infinite products, but are they interesting? And how can we establish, you know, most of, I mean, two or three or four, four go together, which is they're sort of interesting if you can establish interesting problems, right? So, like more meromorphic continuation, functional equation, bounded and vertical trips, things like that. And how do these things allow us to see connections between harmonic analysis, number theory, and geometry? Okay, so that was. So in hindsight, that's, I think, where what Langlands is formed with. So to do that, you have to think about something, um, have to start thinking about groups other than SL2. And so you think about groups like GLN or SLN, SON, SBN, SB2N. Um, these are examples of algebraic groups. So essentially an algebraic group over a, a number field, really, I mean, you can think of these, and you know, certainly for this talk, that's more than enough. Um, and these are all you know, so sort of well known how to define them. But in general, an algebraic group just means you know, a, ma a group that can be realized as a matrix group. Um, it's a, it's a, a colloquial enough way to, to say it, and almost right. And then you can take the rational points over our completions. So those are our, those are our local groups. And then we have our adelic groups, that is, you have the adels. So as I informed them before, the, the infinite product of all the, all the completions. And you can look at the, the, those groups as well, and you can start to a, examine questions. And it turns out a very nice thing is that the, the, the adelic groups are, in fact, the product of the local groups. Again, the product has to be restricted in a certain way that I don't want to say, but it basically means that these things are all compatible. And so automorphic cuspidal representations, in fact, are things that replace automorphic forms. And these are, so representations, of course, are homomorphisms of groups into the group of linear transformations on some vector space. And you know, quite often, I mean, often the interesting ones are, are where the vector spaces, things like Hilbert spaces of you know, function L2 or something. And so these ones are representations which appears in, in L2 of the adelic points modulo the, the, the points of the ground field. And there's the right regular representation, right? So that is, you can take your G dot F. And X is that's a that's a group F. And it, it's, a, it's amazing to me always that this is the, sort of the simplest thing you can think of. 
and it carries an incredible amount of information. So if I have one of these things, it actually turns out it's accurate. Just like you know, in the case of cases, factors and all these little uh, representations, one for each local group. And so what Langland saw is well, this should be associated to this in L function. And it should a local now this is a local L function. This is just the local factor. And it should have some kind of functional equation between L of S and L of 1 minus S and pi V tilde, where this is actually just the contragradient of this. Should have just probably left that alone. That's not so. And these should arise just like in Bayes' thesis. These should arise somehow from harmonic analysis on the group. You can do harmonic analysis on the group. You ask yourself things like the Poincharel thing. What, what, you know, can you recreate a function from its Fourier transform? And then you should also have a global L function, which should be just the product of these local ones, and should have a functional equation, metamorphic continuation, and should be Eulerian in the sense that your global L function should be the product of all the local L functions, and same thing for the, the constants appearing in the functional equation. And, you know, it's a very, very, you know, so, I mean, essentially, uh, I mean, I didn't get to attend these talks, but the talks that Langlands first gave about this were things like, well, I'm thinking of a, thinking of a space, but I don't even know if this space exists, and I'm thinking of a function and not a point in the space, but I don't know if the point exists, because I don't know if the function exists, I don't know if the space exists, but it's going to be something like this, and, but this is sort of what he was thinking about. So where should the arithmetic come in? So, so these L functions could be related to theorist way theorists to something called arc now functions, which I this time I talked a lot about last time, and this time I didn't talk about, but those are associated with the Galois representations. And by the way, that's I should mention that that's the the method of attack that Wiles used was to look at the Galois Galois representation. So in place of the Galois group, you have to modify it a little bit, but there's something called the Bayes-Lean group. But you can just think of the Galois group with the closure. And it has a distinguished conjugacy class. That's really what you need to know. Okay. And just like, I mean, and certainly in the case of a local field, you know, you know, you know that there's a distinguished conjugacy class. So if V is Archimedean, of course, it's just complex conjugation. But if it's not Archimedean, the QP, it's just you know, X goes X. So if I have a, a homomorphism from my, you know, it's called the Galois group, to GLN, so it's a, it's a, it's a degree N representation, then we can define that there's, these are understood in that there's this very important thing called an Arnell function, and that is, you just, it's essentially the characteristic polynomial of uh, associated with the, this, what's called the Frobenius class, that's why we use FR for this distinguished class. So, the idea being that if you knew this, this would tell you about the conjugacy class of the image, and if you knew that, that could tell you something about distinguishing one representation from another, and these were things that Artin was trying to use to study non-abelian extensions. And so, in some sense, Langlands, uh, we think, has the right idea of what that non-abelian class field theory should be, in the sense that there should be a partition of the, what are called irreducible, admissible representations of GLN. So, so it turns out, of course, I use a partition here, but in fact, it's just, they're actually single digits in this case, so I probably should. With, um, and these, it's basically, it's saying that the representations of GLN should be in one-to-one correspondence with n-dimensional representations of the Galois group. And it turns out that this was, and, and it should be, this correspondence should work in such a way that 
the local L function should now be this arc L function, which is well understood from number theory, and the same thing for the epsilon pattern. So, in fact, Langlands proved this conjecture around 19. It's hard to tell really when he proved some things because he didn't publish a whole lot. It was not until 1995 or something that he finally allowed somebody to publish it. Um, so, um, but sometime around 1980. And then there was the proof over a function field in 93 by Lamont Rappaport Schuller. And then for Characteristic zero, this was proved by Harrison Taylor, 1998. And Young uh, had another proof, uh, which he, you know, was, was afterwards, but a simpler proof. And this is what's known as the local language conjecture. And, um, so this, is, this was a big deal. So uh, the global language cor correspondence we can understand for function fields, and that is what the four gives you in the fields in 2000. But here's one place where, you know, what this, what should be the Galois object in, in the global, global cases is just not known. Okay. So, so for more general G, the, you know, representations should come from some kind of Galois representations, and and how would these be distinguished from the the, one, the ones we just looked at for GLN. And so for this language, you realize you needed to formulate something called the L group, which is sort of just the dual object of this one. And so you know, this is a, it's pretty good. It shouldn't be a C here. There should be a dual object to your group. So if your group is GLN, it's dual group to GLN C. The groups SO2N plus 1 and SP2N are dual to each other. SO2N is its own dual. SL2N, the special linear group, its L group is PGL and C. And PGLN, this is projective, right, projective general. So if you don't see why this you know what I mean why this should happen is has has to do for reasons of number theory in here, where I guess why it's cutting and pasting the the things got a little messed up, because now the representations should be partitioned in finite sets, so they're one-to-one -one correspondence with these maps that go into this L group in such a way that the in such a way that the the L functions and the epsilon factors match up. And so this is a, a big a big jump. But now you can imagine that I could then compose with if I have something like this goes to LG that I could compose with something that say goes from LG to some other general linear group, and and so there should be an L function that should give you another representation now of GLM, and so there's an L function and it should be so we call that L of S pi via R, and that these again should be arc L functions, and. This again was known for by the Langlands, but for other fields on beyond GLN, these results were really sporadic. Um, for instance, by Gann and Takeda, and um, for low rank uh, uh, symplectic groups, but um, it was long known that Arthur was working on a proof for classical groups uh, using what's known as functorial transfer. Okay, so, what do I mean by that? Well, Suppose I have an automorphic representation of some group H, and I have a homomorphism from the L group of H to the L group of G. So then the idea is that if I compose the two, I should get a representation of the group G, and then I should, again, for any representation here, have uh, an associated L function, global L function. And everything should match up and it should be argued. And so the idea is that suppose you know the local correspondence, then you could put together right? You could at each at each local place you would get some representation and then you could put them together. 
and Langman's conjecture that that should be automorphic, and its its L function should be the one that comes from the the small the representation of H. So it should be, and this is the idea of functorial transfer. And all of our earlier classical examples, Hecate so theory, Shimura Tamiyama conjectures, class field theory, these are all examples of this. They all now fall into this category. So these all have been unified by this line through this philosophy of language. So it's really broad and wide reaching and what can accomplish. So an important example is if you take SO2n plus 1, its L group is SP2n. And so um, that embeds in GL2n. So notice that there's a group in 2n variables, and this is a group in 2n plus 1 variables. And so some automorphic forms of GL2n should transfer from SO to N plus 1. And uh, the existence of this was proved for generic forms in 2003 by Kogel, Kim, and Gitesky, Shapiro, and Shahidi. And so other examples of this were, in the generic case, were by the same trio in soon after that. And then the, the transfer and the non, like, this is called the generic forms, which I didn't say what those were, but non-generic forms, nobody nobody had uh, much of a handle on until Arthur started his his crusade, if you will, that went on for about 15 years. And um, it seemed, at least. And finally, I think, you know, just a couple of years ago, he finished his book. And in fact, uh, he's now proved that you have all these, for the classical groups, you, you have all the transfers to general linear groups that you want. And since you know the local Langlands conjecture for the general linear group, this gives you the local Langlands conjecture for this group. So this is a huge, huge result. And it's a huge book, by the way. It's like 900 pages. And it's been extended to unitary groups by uh, C. P. I have to say, this is this is a remarkable, actually, I, I think this is a remarkable result of Mach because he's a student of Barry Mazur who didn't really work in this area, but decided he wanted to understand Arthur's book. And so he he sat down, oops, sorry, he sat down with Arthur's book and decided the best way to do this is to try to apply it to a group where the proof hadn't been established yet, which the next obvious case was the unitary group, and in a year he was able to do it. And that's, that's, that's really a rather remarkable. And I'm actually happy to say that he's going to be my colleague at the not next year, the year after. So, really so these are all examples of something called twisted endoscopic. So that says that the uh, in some cases, the, the local transfer should be coming from harmonic analysis. And I, you know, I haven't I haven't phrased this well, but there are there are lots of cases now uh, where we've seen this happen. And so, lo locally and, and globally, and which we really now are starting to understand. And um, an important part of this is actually something called the fundamental lemma, which was, again, out there. I mean, this is, this is the, the curse of Langlands, which is he's understated in a lot of ways. And one of the things he's called this thing a fundamental lemma. And it was, uh, it was impossible to prove. It's a huge step in some way. It's known as the fundamental lemma. And really, the thing for which Engel won the, the field uh, was to be that. So, um, so I mentioned lots of people here that I'd say the last decade is probably a little longer than that, I guess. But, uh, but um, roughly a decade, decade and a half. Uh, there's been a lot of, lot of progress. So I just give you some final thoughts, which is that you know, I hope I give you some, one, some motivation for why you want to try and do this, because it's, 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 a, it's a torturous undertaking in some way. Um, but. Um, but Langland sort of had this far-reaching vision that, you know, far exceeded uh, what anybody else was thinking of, that maybe with one or two exceptions. Right? There are other people.
And then the past, say, 20 years, it's seen a lot of developments. You know, maybe, uh, the most well-known, of course, I think, being the Vermont. <coughs> but in fact, there, there are in fact, a lot more striking things uh, that have come out. And for instance, uh, estimates to um, Ramanujan conjecture have just improved dramatically in the past 15 years, only to this. So, and again, not you know, not from where you might have thought they would come from when the conjecture was formed. So, and that's what I'm saying. Here, the applications of problems of classical number theory, they're significant. There's going to be more. I mean, this is just going to keep happening for the next, I think, uh, 15 or 20 years at least. And that's that. that there's a lot to be done. Lots of good problems. And, uh, it's what makes it an interesting area to work in because there's no end of the problems. Um, but of course, as you know, some things are, uh, uh, sometimes sometimes problems seem like they, they just can't be <laughs> can't be solved. <laughs> but uh, but it, I mean it, it is remarkable. I mean I think you know, I I remember sitting with a colleague you know, 20 years ago and he, he said you know, I, he said I'm really impressed because I don't think we'll ever see any of these conjectures proven now. He's still depressed because <laughs> he said, well, I've seen all these conjectures proved in these cases, but you know, what about the other cases? Yeah. You know, I, mean, I, I still don't think we're ever going to see them. So, yeah, well, they'll be seen. Right? Maybe, 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 maybe not. But, yeah. So inner forms are groups which are whose structures let's just say are not quite so nice. Right? And things like GLN over division algebra is an example of an inner form. Um, I, I, I doubt we'll see. I mean, I know we'll probably not see the symmetric powers. I mean, I like that this is going higher than they they've gone. So there are these references. The symmetric power L functions, which uh, I mentioned the Ramanujan conjecture, which has to do with you know, predicting a uh, prediction about the, the, co the absolute value coefficients of certain are more conformal than the absolute value of one. Um, I, I don't think we'll see that. Because we won't see that the, the symmetric powers are just out of, they're out of, they're out of tricks. Uh, below the second, third, fourth, you know, you get, there's no way to go any, any further, really. With that, with that method, so you need a whole, you need a whole new. I mean, may, you know, maybe, you know, maybe somebody will. I mean, that's the thing. I, mean, I, I don't think, I don't see a way. But other people who have much better vision than me, like, like Joe, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he may, he may move. Okay. Yeah. I want also to ask about L functions. So you have for representations, L functions defined for generic representation. Mm -hmm. And now when you have Langlands correspondence, yeah. you are attached to, the, to other right. representations yeah. L functions. So do you think there is uh, some uh, way of defining these L functions just coming yeah. from representation? Intrinsically from representation. Yeah. So what what the Brock is mentioning is I, I talked about the partition of representation of the finite set. And one of the things is this mythical word generic I use, because conjecture, which is now pretty well understood, that every one of these finite sets are called L packets. Every one of these L packets should have a generic member, and all the members in that packet, all the members of finite, that finite set of representation, should be what's called L indistinguishable. And you can think of that as all their L functions are equal. All they, they're equal for every single L function. And I can, if you want, show you an example of that. But, um, so one of those is known to be generic. Okay. Now, I mean, 
Now, there's a conjecture. So at least one of them is what's called generic. And for generic ones, they have, we have methods, mainly from Langlands and Shahidi, to, to assign these L functions. And it's, yeah, that was quite a big undertaking, which I, I probably neglected to say enough about. But um, how do you get the non-generic ones? I don't, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it's also, you have to remember that generic depends on the choice of character. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, so for SLN, mm -hmm. right, if you have a, we know they have, they have lots of L packets which you know, have one generic member, but every member of the packet is generic for some character. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's how we can define the L packets for each member is to pick the right generic character. So. That that I'm I'm pretty sure would not work. I think they're I mean, I'm going a little far afield, but I believe there there probably there are some cases where that wouldn't work. I mean, and so the idea would be if you pick a, if you if you change the generic the, the character enough, you get all you get all the all the uh, the function for any individual representation. Mm -hmm. But I think there's some that are like a fashion, just not generic. I don't know. I mean, that's a good. That's a good question. I mean, I should say that you know, the, I had a, I had an idea, which because you know, it, it may come to fruition now, but, you know, which is that um, so Saul Freeberg and I looked at um, using other kinds of so these gen just generic has to do with something called uh, Whitaker models. So we had an idea of having sort of more degenerate models, which were showing up in some of his work and generalizing to the, what we call the you know, generalized Bessel models, and that everything would have some model, and you use the model to get the L function. So and that did it work? Mm, we got we we were not, had not been able to get that to work, and we sort of given up on it. But part of the reason we couldn't get that to work was our, the Archimedean uniqueness was not known, so we have that now, but um, it's still uh, it's still not clear. It's still not clear that there, there are people working on it. So that might, that might, that might happen. I'm not sure if it will happen. I mean, I, tr I, I, I tried pretty hard for a while, and even, even in some low-dimensional cases, I just did not, did not seem to want to so for example, uh, PNTS does have, I mean, just before there's an example where a vessel model is used to get an L fraction. Right. Yeah. Is it the same? Hmm? Is it the same? Can you get the standard L function? Yeah. Just yeah. before is okay. the same yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that the case, the, I mean, there, yeah, there, there are cases where it can be done through other models and, you know, these four H coding models and sometimes people are ways to check these L functions. I think when we know both, you know, when we know, I think we still know that they get the right thing, but mm -hmm. and it'll be interesting. I, mean, I, I don't know that, you know, now, you know, now that you have Arthur work on, you know, people are probably may, may not try it, so right? It may not be as interesting. I think um, this business of, of different models, I guess you can think of those as gener generalized Delphine Graham mm -hmm. coefficients. And, and something that I, the last time I saw Arthur speak, he was very interested in the problem of, okay, you prove the existence of these things, that, that these automorphic representations exist somewhere, but how can we realize them as spaces of functions? Okay. And the Bessel model is also sort of a, a not, it's not exactly a functor, but it's another way of, of giving explicit constructions of spaces of functions. So yeah. That's true. I mean, that's, you know, interest. so, I mean, I guess, you know, it may, it, you know, so if Ellen Parker's interested, then I guess. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I've been, you know, I, I, I can tell you that, you know, I, it was, it still is, you know, it's still something that I, I'm interested in and I, you know, I have on the back burner, and so I usually throw it in. It's one of the things I'm working on, and, you know, when I write my NSF grant, and for years that, you know, for ten years I, I was here for ten years I was hearing oh well, you know, Arthur's doing this and what's the point of that? So, <laughs> so uh, certainly there's some people who don't think they Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have a
encouragement. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.